digital businesses of tomorrow are going to be built around like small, passionate fan groups. How did you go from starting a company in your college dorm room to working in one of the coolest buildings in New York oh, City? Oh, thanks. A lot of just like hard work and messing up along the way and being in the right place at the right time in certain industries, uh, but mostly luck. Mostly luck. Yeah. Where do you think the internet is in its evolution right now? I think we used to be in this world of people viewing videos on websites. You go to the HuffingtonPost.com or something and you like view videos. And now people don't really go to websites as much as view it on platforms like Facebook and YouTube. When you were creating College Humor mm -hmm. in your dorm room at Wake Forest, yep. what was the vision at that time? My friend Josh, his older brother was working for an internet company called Advertising.com. It was a very early web 1.0 company and he basically told us like, hey, if you guys can get people to a website, you can make money like a newspaper. It's so obvious now, but if then we started to explain to people, oh, we're trying to do this thing and you can make money. And we chose college humor because we were in college and we were goofballs. And we just said, hey, well, all this crazy stuff that our friends send us and like stuff that we make ourselves or write ourselves or little videos we shoot, we'll just put them on the site. And, and that's how it started out. It was yep. pretty simple, Yep. but obviously revolutionary because at the time no one was talking about yeah. making money in that way. Yeah, it was one of the first user generated sites. People would send in content that they made. Eventually we started making our own content and we just passed 10 million YouTube subscribers. It's a big milestone for any video property online, but comedy especially. 10 million YouTube 10 subscribers. Million. Yep. What's the secret? I remember the meeting where we were deciding this was right after YouTube came out and we were like, should we try to put our videos on this new platform and see if it works? works or should we hold back and a lot of our competitors were holding back because they're like we don't want to put on put our videos on this platform that's untested we don't know if we're gonna make money on it we don't we know give it away enough. we're giving it away for free and then as it turns out we had a first mover advantage there and kind of got beachfront real estate these social platforms are kind of like rich get richer if you have a lot of subscribers or a lot of followers on Facebook or fans or whatever, you get more opportunity to show people your new stuff and then it, it snowballs and, and builds on itself. And I think that's the conundrum for any content creator now mm -hmm. who's just coming out. It's really tough now with all the content that's out there to stand out. The key for content creators trying to make content now is to find a very a very small group and make content for them. Everybody's trying to make content for the masses because they think like, I want to be big, I want to make it for the masses. But actually, you could, you'd be better off if you start small and then build off of that. So the example I always use is, if you wanted to make a video and have it get a lot of hits, instead of making a video about the United States of America, make it about the state of Delaware because everybody from Delaware will share that video with each other. Whereas a video about the US, like, people don't feel as much of a connection to the whole country because it's it's so diffused. But people are like, I'm from Delaware, I love Delaware. They share with their <laughs> friend from Delaware. And uh, so I think- If that, I was from Delaware, I would share that you, video. Yes, you'd be all over that But video. as a Minnesotan, I cannot share no, that no, video. No. <laughs> Treason. <laughs> to make something that a lot of people find funny and not just you, you have to really do a gut check every time you put something out and say, is this just an insidery thing that I think is funny because of my personal experience or are other people going to relate? What if Google was just a guy? Hedgehog cute! You mean hedgehog? What if Batman chose a different voice? Where were the drugs going? College Humor answers these types of questions every day. College Humor partnered with It's On Us. Yep and created a PSA about sexual assault. Yes. It combined a really serious topic, mm -hmm. but with a really humorous approach. Yeah. The bear's not gonna eat all of us. It, it'll be less than a quarter of us. It'll finish us all, Jake. What in five? I can protect your friend. What in five? What in five? We always say if something's not shared, it's not gonna be seen. So if we had just made a boring video with statistics, probably wouldn't have been shared. If you look at Anybody putting any kind of content out nowadays, mm -hmm. you're gonna have the camp of people who love it and you're going to have the camp of people who hate it. Yeah. What amounts of content are not being created nowadays? Purely because that echo chamber gets so loud and it literally can ruin people's careers. Yeah, yeah. I think people are pausing before they do things that, that could be considered uh, T a touchy subject. I There's so many considerations nowadays. Uh, yeah. Sometimes I think about what I might perceive as the most innocuous thing in the yes. entire world. I mean, 
saying that I like bread、yes. could actually be a problem. It's so funny because it might have gluten in it's it. It's so funny you use that example because <laughs> I did a, a PowerPoint to some executives recently, and I told them this is how the outrage cycle works. First step was a a blogger like burns toast one day, and then and then searches for other people online who may have burnt toast, and then like if you can embed three tweets. You have a trend piece. Then the headline is like outrage over burning toast consumes internet, and then it goes from there to、uh, to like the kind of bigger blogs, and then the bigger blogs pick it up and it's trending on Twitter with a hashtag like f toast or something, <laughs> and then from there it's on GMA and the Today Show, and like, and then it's a thing. What gets clicked is things that are salacious and controversial and and are pointing a finger at somebody. And when we take some poor Person who's never asked to be in the spotlight, and then, and then we say we all like point the finger at them and and say like shame on you, and they're like I I didn't even, I was a mistake. I'm like 12 years old.、Um, <laughs> hopefully, we'll kind of correct that as a society and be like, you know, maybe we shouldn't be like on these witch hunts anymore. Do you think there'll ever come a time where there's outrage fatigue? Where maybe the pendulum swings the Possibly, other direction? I hope, yeah, I think so. I think there could be. Do you think that? Comedy, especially in the digital age, treats all politics equal. I think some politicians lend themselves more to being lampooned, but the answer to the question kind of depends on where you sit. My Facebook feed is completely different from somebody else's, who may be more conservative or more liberal. It's an easy trap to fall into to think the entire world looks like your Facebook feed. I think filter bubbles are a very Important thing to pay attention to when trying to gauge the temperature of, of any、uh, public sentiment. It raises a big question, though.、Yeah. If Facebook is the internet,、mm-hmm. and if there are these filter bubbles, which I'm not doubting, I see、yeah. it happen every day. What does that mean for the state of our thinking, the way that people perceive, the fact that people can essentially tune out everything that they don't want to have、yeah. in their lives? Yeah. Well, I think it just leads to more polarization. Your information just gets amplified around what you already believe. We've really seen the results of that in this election cycle. Do you, as a creator of content,、uh-huh. feel any responsibility to correct that issue? In everything you do, you you have to make sure that you're you're seeing both sides. A rule that we use around here, and this was I got, stole this from the the National Lampoon in the '70s. When we make a, a piece of content. We always have to ask: Is it funnier than it is angry? People can tell when you're just trying to push an agenda instead of trying to make them laugh. People share for one reason because of identity creation. They want to pass a piece of content along to their friends because it's, it's like the modern bumper sticker. It's like this funny video about this candidate.、Uh, you know, is 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 me saying I agree with what's said here in this digital age, like. That is, that's the pin, that's the bumper sticker, and that's how we tell our friends where we stand on an issue. One very interesting thing about the business of all of、yep. this: just because you have an audience doesn't mean you're making money. Yeah. So you can have a massive audience now and not be making money still. It didn't used to be like that. When we started, there weren't that many websites to go to, so there was scarcely there were barriers to entry. Right now, there are no barriers to entry. Anybody can start a website, start a blog, put ads on it. Prices of digital ads aren't as high, which means if you actually want to make money online. You have to say, am I selling them merchandise? Because now I have a fan base that, and they want to be part of it. Am I leading them to some like subscription service where they can pay to be part of this community? It's no longer enough to just put up a website, put ads on it, and try to build a business. What do you think the next massive business will be built on? A lot of content businesses that I think are.、Uh, Uh, on the right path. One of which I talk about a lot is Crunchyroll. It's Japanese anime. You pay, I think, like six bucks a month or something. Now you're probably thinking there's not a big audience for、uh, <laughs> for Japanese anime, but they have like 750,000 subscribers or something like that. They are finding that niche, and those people are passionate, and they will pay. I think the next big businesses in online content are going to be. Built around like passionate groups of content consumers. They, they might not watch the equivalent of, let's say,、um, Good Morning America. Good morning. No. <laughs>、uh, no, I mean, I think I actually think in terms of content, what will survive is like kind of like live breaking news. I think people will tune into TV for that because you want to feel plugged in. But but I think the digital businesses of tomorrow are going to be built around like small passionate fan groups. 
how do you make money on that? Because、mm. sure, you can build a business、yep. that gets really passionate people involved, but if you don't have the scale, it's really hard to stay afloat well, to I, continue to exist. Well, I, I actually think if you've identified people who are passionate enough, you don't need scale. So I'll take for example. There's a company called The Information. Right now, it's it's basically just technology sector news. They have people paying. I think it's like thirty dollars a month for us, and basically a access to a couple stories a day about tech. Now that's not a large group, but when you have people paying a dollar a day and you have fifty thousand subscribers, or I don't know their numbers, but if people are passionate enough about that particular subject, they're willing to to cough up a, a pretty penny for it, especially. If they can write it off as a business expense, so we should all figure out businesses that、exactly. people can write off on their yeah, taxes. We'd like, all be in a great place. Yeah, start a business that's like we know more about oil commodities <laughs> trading than anybody else, and like, if, of course, oil commodity people are going to subscribe to it. Like, well, why not? Note to self. Note to self. You started out in internet, but、yep. really, you have moved more and more towards television. Yeah, so it's just it's another way of of. Monetizing stuff you do online. So, for example, we have a show on True TV called Adam Ruins Everything. Hey, Vanessa, 35k a year, not bad. <laughs> Megan, ooh, 70, good going. And that's a show that specifically came out of our YouTube channel. It got millions of views. We said,、oh, let's try another. We did that. It got millions of views again. And then we did about four or five. And we said, why don't we take this to a TV network and see if they want to do it? What would you like to do next? To be cliche, like the world is changing, and and I think a lot of parts of the old economy are now being updated. It's a cool world out there to try to take an assumption that has been held for decades and then say, well, what if you did it this way? Right now, it's so easy to test out an idea for a new business because of things like. Amazon Web Services and Facebook ads. You just have to remember to give up an idea on an idea if the data says that you should. Give me an example of a time where you had to kill an idea. We wanted to start this index of the entire comedy web, and we called it Jest. We bought the domain name Jest.com, and we said anybody's going to be able to search for a comedian or a joke or anything. And as it turned out, a couple things were happening at the same time. One, the moving the world was moving from search to social. And so people weren't as likely to search for something, and also it was kind of an idea that we would use, but probably not a lot of other people because we're comedy nerds. So we had to kill it. Sometimes it actually takes an unbiased third party to say, "Yeah, you should kill it," because you're so in the middle of it, and it, it's hard to <laughs> hard to face that reality. What else is、uh, out there that you've got your eye on? Maybe five or six years ago, I gave a speech, and in the speech, I, I asked, "When will?" When will it be the case that where there's somebody who's making online content and they don't want to graduate to TV? Like, like their their goal isn't to jump away from YouTube for forever. I never found anyone who was making online content that wouldn't just like sign that TV contract until I I my friend Casey Neistat is a YouTube creator and very talented guy. I know from knowing him that he's not trying to jump out of the web. That's where he connects with his fan base. And so I, I think we're going to start to see more of that happening. People who grew up natively online making content, and they're not actively trying to get a TV deal. And that's because why? Because if you are running a Like with Casey, it's him, and he he shoots it, and he edits、freedom. it, and he, yeah, he has freedom, and also you can make enough money if it's just a small team、uh, to to live a good life. I'm Ricky Van Veen from College Humor, and you're watching Real Biz with Rebecca Jarvis. Damn. Perfection. That was, that was One take wonder.